Okay, my, my name's Andrew, Andrew McDonald. I'm from uh, Cream Productions. We're a production company here in Toronto, and uh, it, this talk is about uh, immersive productions, and so this is a story of how I ended up in the world of immersive productions, which is sort of this new term we're using to define something that no one's really defined yet. Um, so this talk is t entitled Expeditions into the Uncanny Valley. Everyone knows what the Uncanny Valley is here, I assume. All right, the, uh, it's that sort of, especially with humans represented in, in uh, virtual characters, it's that sort of place where uh, a character sort of doesn't look like it's an animated character, but doesn't look quite human. And this is where I've found myself floundering in for the last year. Um, so a bit of background. So Cream Productions is a, a television production company in Toronto that's uh, primarily working in these verticals like Nat Geo, History, Discovery Channel. Uh, one of our more famous shows, uh, Survivor Man, which is, I think, one of the more syndicated shows around the planet, and uh, Wild Things, which is a sort of a more recent show we've done, which sort of plays into this talk a little bit later on, featuring uh, Dominic Monaghan. <clears throat> so we uh, got into virtual reality about three years ago, three and a half years ago, with the owner of the company deciding you know, someone had put a headset on his face, and, and he went, this, this is astounding. Um, and I want to I want to get in as a TV producer. I want to get into producing this stuff. So I had uh, teamed up with him and brought another partner of mine on, and we began the VR division uh, within Cream. So we basically we started in VR with 360 videos, and this was three and a half years ago when you had to kind of make your own cameras. Uh, we were fortunate enough that you know because we already had existing clients like networks that we were working with who were at the time all wanting to do their own VR play. Um, so we were able, to, and most of that work is, is, was ancillary content for existing television shows that we were already doing. So <clears throat> it was rather good timing. We ended up, um, and, well, clearly we had to, you know, manufacture some of our own cameras because at the time there, there was no Ozo available or any of these more current VR cameras that are out. So we, you know, hacked together cameras with lenses out of Japan and, and various rigs that we had to 3D print. And we flew around the world and we shot uh, basically ancillary content for some of the shows we did on Travel Channel, uh, Discovery Channel. Um, Hulu was one of our latest clients uh, and they launched a Hulu VR app uh, last year. Um, and that's sort of like my background is filmmaking. I've done, you know, 18 years of, of shooting this kind of content uh, as a cameraman. So we brought our, our skills as, as uh, TV makers to VR. So. And I got to tell you, shooting in 360 is, is quite a challenge. So, I mean, this is one example. We um, had a piece for Discovery Channel based on the Civil War. This is one of the early trench battles in the Civil War. And we, uh, we got money from Discovery Channel to do a bespoke piece in one of our sets. Um, by the way, if you're going to shoot 360 video, a trench is a great location because you can kind of put the camera in the trench and get your crew to just back up 10 feet and you're clear. <laughs> what we did was figure out a way to move the camera through the trench. So that's a track and a, and a long jib arm hanging the camera out. And uh, this down here on the bottom is uh, one of our latest rigs. This was uh, for the Hulu piece that we did with Dominic Monaghan, where we shot Dominic in stereo uh, in a 360 green screen sort of background and uh, move the camera and we did all our motion track solving in, in post, but we needed to shoot in stereo and we needed head to toe. So we had this crazy contraption that we, we built here. Uh, so that culminated in this piece. This is what we're showing here at, uh, at the festival. So this is a, uh, The Curious Mind. Um, it was paid for by Microsoft and Hulu, who last year were launching their Hulu VR app and bundled up with the Microsoft MR headsets that had just come out. And this is sort of where we want to work in VR. So this, our, our company does that sort of factual entertainment uh, programming. So this piece is sort of a pop science piece, like on the Carl Sagan's Cosmos kind of vibe, uh, but using Dominic as a, as a host. And it, it explores uh, the concept of Earth as a, as a superorganism. So but one of the things, so what I wanted to get into in this talk is how we ended up in, in volumetric uh, production, as it were. So one of the things we began to notice is that a lot of these three, the 360 video platform, other than festivals, uh, like the one Brian throws here, which is fantastic, where you get to really see quality pieces in a headset, but mostly this 360 video content was coming out on, on these two platforms. And of course, you know, Discovery had their own, Hulu, um, Jaunt, and Little Star. And these are, these are sort of semi-paid platforms with, um, like Hulu is subscription based and Little Star does a lot of work with their uh, blockchain technology of, of selling uh, content. But 
Mostly it's consumed on these things, um, using this, which is the worst way to watch any 360 video. Uh, and the net result is kind of not a lot of ROI on it all. So we kind of saw this about two, two years ago as, as you know, what, what are we going to do about this? So uh, what, what talk is incomplete without this graph? Everyone's seen this one before. Um, so we, we kind of, like in our experience, we did ride the top of that wave when, <coughs> when we had um, uh, the networks paying for our, uh, our content creation. And then we, re we knew it was going to go down here, so we actually kind of stopped looking for that work and started, uh, fortunately being in Canada, chasing the soft monies that are out there for innovation and, 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 create and creating this kind of content. So, you know, as we all know, we, we are somewhere down around the bottom of that trough right now, as the, the guy from Greenlight was explaining this morning. But fortunately, we were able to cushion all of that with uh, some, you know, some uh, investment uh, from uh, the, the Canadian uh, soft monies for, for creating this kind of stuff. Um, but this is, one of the, this is another graph that, that keeps me going in this whole thing. So this, this is a forecast down into 2025. And it, it remind, it's a reminder that it's not just about our, our, our vertical here, which is that big green thing, which is sort of gaming and entertainment and all this stuff. But the whole other side is all the industry applications for, uh, for virtual reality. I mean, from healthcare, engineering, education, there's... There's, there's all this other side of virtual reality that's, that's in, is, whether it's AR, or MR, XR, or emergent content, I believe is the brand new term that VR Society came up with. There's still all these other elements that are going to keep this moving forward. I don't think it's going away. I don't think it's a, a fad in any way. And here's more current stats that just came out in 2017 that, that, that are very encouraging. Does this have a laser pointer? We go. So, you know, the fact that there's, you know, 90% satisfaction on people who actually put on a proper volumetric headset with hand controllers and, and have a real experience, you know, that, it, there are very encouraging stats that, that are coming out if you, if you look for them. So we, uh, we decided to level up um, into, you know, the, as we all know, the, one more place, into, you know, the volumetric space where you're, you're actually engaged and you get to, to move around. Um, and also the main reason is, is because it, it, it provides like a clear path to, to ROI, as far as I can tell. I mean, you've got platforms like, you know, Viport and Steam and, and Oculus where in order to get the experience, you got to buy it. It's, it's bundled up as an app and it comes to you uh, in, your, in your headset where you're prepared to, to, to watch and you're not casually coming across it on a phone you're actually putting on a headset and you're, you're intending to experience a virtual reality experience. So, um, but then we look, well, we're not a games company. So we're, we're, a, we're a television production company making factual entertainment. So we kind of looked at it and we realized, you know, game engines aren't just for, for gaming. So we looked at what people do in VR and uh, the different uh, activities that part people participate in VR. And uh, realized that kind of we hit three of these targets pretty pretty clearly. Um, you know, it's a single player game, exploring a destination, and uh, learning about a topic are all within the wheelhouse of of what what Cream does as its core business. Um, so we looked at uh, what works in VR or the local airport code YVR, <laughs> um, and. Uh, you know, I started to look at experiences that I enjoy. I mean, my whole philosophy throughout my entire career has been to, to, to make television I would watch. I, I went from music videos into commercials briefly and realized that it was full of idiots and I couldn't or function well in a commercial environment. So I went, what TV do I watch? I watched Discovery, History, Nat Geo, that kind of programming. So I, you know, almost 15 years ago, moved into that, that genre of, of work. So I decided to do the same thing with virtual reality. So. One of the first experiences that, that was really profound to me was, was this one. This is Mission ISS. Uh, I don't know if anyone's experienced it, but um, NASA puts out these models for free. So someone had taken the model of the International Space Station and ported it into VR. Now, with the space station, you know, you're all familiar with the photograph. You see you know, the astronaut sitting in the space station with the background, and you have an idea what the space station is like. But you don't, if you were put in there right now, you couldn't find the bathroom from the cupola. Like you, you don't know your way around, but in, in this experience, um, you actually get to float in zero gravity. This, I think this was pre-Lone um, Echo, which is one of the cooler games. But you get to float in virtuality, you get to explore the space station, 
And to be honest, you spend like 20 minutes in here, you could go to the space station and know your way around instantly. There's this sort of spatial awareness that you learn from being in, in virtual reality. Um, other similar experiences like Titanic VR, this, this piece, um, they went to, uh, uh, they, they took scans of the Titanic. This is by, uh, I think it's Educational VR out of uh, Ireland. And they took scans of the Titanic and you get to explore the Titanic with uh, uh, a rover and, and see it as it kind of currently exists on, on the ocean floor. So it's, it's, this is in the wheelhouse also of factual. I need to have a glass of water though. <laughs> is, there, is there a bottle of water or a glass? Thanks. So, um, and then now there's this. This, everyone's seen the experience, Alamiette. This, this is uh, storytelling, or at least the first piece that I saw of storytelling in VR. We saw, I saw this in, in Cannes in 2016. Yeah, it was demoed in Cannes, and we were, invi we were invited to Cannes, and this was premiering at Cannes. I, I saw it for the first time, and it, it was someone using VR, of, of, telling a volumetric uh, narrative story. And I don't know if anyone hasn't seen it, you're, you're looking almost like at a maquette of, of these uh, characters, and you follow a story, and you get to like hover over it like a giant. It's, it's, uh, it was actually quite compelling. Uh, I saw a lot of people pull the headset off in tears, because <laughs> it's actually, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a very heavy story. Um, and then Titanic actually did something similar as well. They uh, took their game in a second version of it that just got released. They took the model of, of the boat that they have, and they filled it with all these uh, avatars and um, created this sort of, it, it's a volumetric experience where you're, you're there and you, you're on the boat and you can actually be there as it sinks and, and see this drama play out <clears throat> within, the, within the piece. But again, it, it lacks participation. Like you're, it's, it's <clears throat> quite like a 360 video, except you've got this ability to have, oh, awesome, thank you. You've got this ability to, um, <clears throat> to look around, to like look behind people, but you can't poke anybody, you can't touch it, you can't, you can't save anybody, you're just there participating in a, in a non-interactive non way. And then so we looked at uh, other games like this. This was a Rick and Morty, very highly successful game, one of the few success stories in, in VR gaming that came, I think they made their money back in the year that they, they released. And it's, uh, it's avatar hosted, so the, it's very cartoony, but it's, you know, it's using the Rick and Morty IP. I think this is, is this Rick or Morty? I'm not sure. Rick. Okay, so this is Rick. Um, and it's sort of a, it's a puzzler based game where you have to solve puzzles to keep the, to keep the thing progressing. <clears throat> um, so what we were look, what we looked at, we, we looked at all this stuff and put it all together and came up with, with this equation. Why don't we take what we do and see if we can push it through some kind of a, a gamified element through a game engine and, and see what we come up with. Um, and thus was born uh, this concept. So uh, imagine a world where humanity's greatest inventions have been lost and only you can rediscover them. And we got to be curious. Um, so be curious is an extension of the piece that we're showing here. It's with Dominic Monaghan. And it's essentially you're with him and you travel forward through time with Dominic Monaghan. And in order to advance the game forward, you have to recreate uh, some of humanity's greatest innovations uh, with the materials that were available at the time. And we're actually uh, just working right now on closing a deal with uh, Natural History Museum where we're able to actually volumetrically scan some of the objects that are key to the game. So you'll actually be working with objects that were there, for example, to move into the agrarian society, you had to figure out a mortar and pestle and grind grains into powder. So we actually have a scan of a Neolithic mortar and pestle that we get to actually art, interact with in the game. So it's, it's an also opportunity for, you know, market channel partners as well with, with uh, natural history museums. But the key thing for us is, is this, is the avatar. Um, there's, um, our, our, a lot of our work is, is host-driven, and it relies on, on characters like Dominic, who's, who's a brilliant television host. He's enthusiastic, he's engaging, and he keeps the, the story moving and, and things that, that potentially could be dry, very interesting. So we were after creating an avatar um, at, at as low a cost as possible. So I'm going to get into that next, but I just want to set up the, sort of the three or the, the two kinds of avatars that currently exist in VR. And, and one of the key things, too, we've seen avatars in the movie Avatar and Planet of the Apes and such, but we've got to remember in virtual reality, it's runtime. You've got to deliver 
a realistic looking human avatar in a VR headset off a consumer computer live. So there's a lot of limitations that you got to work with. But so I'm going to quickly talk about these uh, kinds of, of avatars that exist right now. So this one, the first one I call the Princess Leia, and this is videogrammetry. So this is taking a bunch of video cameras, putting a person in the middle of it and shooting them with the video cameras live and then putting that entire video together. But you end up with what I call the Princess Leia because the avatar looks and does exactly what it did when it was shot. So if you're over here, it's looking this way. It's not interactive. It's, it's, it's like, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi. So. Standard procedure for retirement debrief is that you tell us if you know the replicant. And this is the Blade Runner experience. You know that. Now if you'll see, Holding two memories and reminded hands, ones also produces tears dissonance quite a bit. and it's interferes it's with the stellar memory transfer. Fortunately, I was able to save both memories to my system, but the interference but the means and the, fidelity the memories have been good. erased from your mind. So you have a memory. This is what I call the Andy Circus, which is completely create a puppet and animate it. So Jack, echo. what happened? Um, my calibration program crashed. I appear to be stuck in the activation pod. That's odd. Your diagnostic programs never just flat out crashed before. It must have suspended the pod's release procedure. And then, oh, so this is the third, this is the L.A. Noir hybrid. So this is basically taking the first version that we just saw. I'm the Officer of Phelps. Sticking a fully... It is just head, Officer of Phelps. Sticking on a Isn't body. it, lad? Yes, sir. Then let me have a word with the Chief of Police, young Phelps. The department needs heroes. The problem with this one is it's it's huge as a, as a build. They've got these full-blown videogrammetry heads that are running on... Um, procedurally driven bodies, but the, the amount of data that's in there, where's my slide, to make that, that head, uh, it makes the game quite big. I think when it, sh this L.A. Noir ship that came on three discs uh, when it was just for your, for your PS, via, PS PlayStation. So we looked at trying to make a hybrid because the key thing for us is, is we're trying to make a, 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 a volumetric interactive experience in this VR marketplace, but if because of the user, we've all talk, heard about this in this morning's talks. The user base is so small that if you if you're kind of capped, if you spend you know over one or two million dollars on your game, you're never going to get the ROI back on it because there just aren't enough people to buy it. But we're now we're getting into a place where we want um, a game that's sort of hosted by an avatar. We need lots of character seconds of avatar, but we don't to, we don't have you know the budget to finish. Thousands, uh, thousands of character seconds of Avatar because it'll push the cost of building your game higher than you're ever going to make it. So our, our key goal here was to try and go after our, the best looking Avatar we could do at the lowest cost per character second. So we came up with this idea. So this something we're working in, uh, in Toronto with the CERT program at Sheridan, which is the Screen Industries Research and Technology Program. And we've got a bit of innovation funding, uh, thanks again to the Canadian system, which is great. And we're taking... Um, a combination of, of an animated blend-shaped face <clears throat> and putting the video back on that face. Now, with the Andy Serkis one, you saw the dots on Andy Serkis's face. That's the sort of the older school method of doing this. Now, with machine learning, you can shoot a performance of a face and pull that mocap data out of that performance, and then you've still got clean video because there are no tracking dots, so we're putting that video back on the face. So it's, 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 it's a crazy world which ends up with like weird ass stuff like this coming up. So this is, you know, our, our, our we shot Dom with um, several cameras and stitched them all together. Sort of the reverse of stitching 360 videos as a sphere, we were stitching it as, as a ball. And we came up with this basically this normal map of a video performance that we we're gonna put back on his face. But I'll, I'll let Dom describe it here because he's a, he's a little bit better at it than me, believe it or not, he knows nothing about it. <laughs> performance that I do over there will go into the computer. Similar to what you might see in Gollum or King Kong. Lots of people say to me, oh, that computer generated character Gollum was amazing, but actually that was a performance by Andy Serkis in this type of suit, and his performance went directly into the movie, so that's what we're gonna try and replicate today. I see the transcript of what I said yesterday alongside a moving video image of how I performed yesterday, and I'm just matching it with this.
Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like being around a wild animal. How are we ever going to finish anything in this world if you keep breaking everything in the demo? Quit it. Thank you. As an actor, we do this thing called ADR, which is additional dialogue recording, where it just captures what you said in an audio form so that it matches to the video. This is kind of matching the audio form with a little bit of face performance as well. So it's kind of a video ADR, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Reference is rolling. Be curious, scene four, take two, marker. I'm having this place built so I can take apart stuff and see how it all works. Really, we'll be able to do anything in here from creating a black hole to pulling apart an atom. Actually, actually, to pull apart atoms with black holes, I need to put that on the list. Hey, Glenn, Glenn, black hole. We need what? Uh, one black hole. How about a tight orbit around Saturn? There's so much to explore. to explore. So, and this is really cool, right? Smell me. Go on. Smell my neck. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. You can't smell it in virtual reality. So, as you can see, I mean, we're, we're well down the path of getting our avatar done. It's it, There's a, our second iteration, which we're coming out with now, which has got marked improvements on this one. The key, the tricky thing with doing a face is if it's not bang on perfect, it looks, and the best description I've had on criticism and feedback was disturbing. So, we're, we're, uh, we, but we do have, uh, we got a lot of faith in this, and I think we've got um, something in the works next time around that's going to look quite good and, and pretty cheap to make. So the next stage is uh, uh, photogrammetry. So uh, as I was describing earlier, working with the Natural History Museums, this is a technique where you can take multiple photographs of a single object. And then again, through machine learning, it can examine each photograph, match pixels, and develop a fairly high-res, pretty cool three-dimensional rendering of it. So we're, oh, here's an example. Okay, so, and then you can also do the reverse. You can now create uh, three-dimensional scan. Oh, so these are examples of, um, Figure, uh, art items that we will be including in the game. And a cool thing is a lot of this stuff is like open source. I mean, the, the, the British Museum has scanned all of their stuff and it belongs to all of us. So in this context, we can you know use this stuff in, in the game. Um, and then you can do the reverse, which is take real locations and uh, photogrammetically scan them. So we're looking at combining the avatar, the objects, and the location. So this is just work we've done. This is an alleyway down on Queen Street. And then there's, I just had to give a plug to my buddy Simon Che DeBoer, who just released this on uh, Steam. It's also free. I think um, Curiosity Stream paid for this. And they flew him to Egypt, and he did the Nef Neferati's tomb, which, if you have a chance to check it out, is stunning. It's, it's the actual tomb. It's like being there without going to Egypt. <clears throat> so we basically want to take all of these elements and mash them together in the vertical that we know, which is factual entertainment, host-driven, and create something. Now, I'm adamant that we're not game makers. We're trying to make immersive content, I guess is the term, or whatever we want to call it. But I'm beginning to realize, as the previous talk just said as well, you've got to iterate and test and try this stuff out. And the more we do this, I realize that uh, TV production does not equal uh, volumetric interactive production. And as much as I hate to say that I'm not into making games, I'm finding myself watching more and more keynotes by guys like this, which are titled, You're Not Special, Nor Is Your Game, and You'll Never Ship a Hit. So, <laughs> so basically, uh, you know, that's where we're at right now. We're going into production in early uh, 20, 2019, and so we'll keep you posted. And seriously, Please, we'll keep you posted because we need beta testers to find out uh, to find out how we're doing. Okay. Thank you, Andy.